Hello. Today I'm happy to announce that this Thursday Bayer will complete the acquisition of Monsanto. This is good news for several reasons. It's first of all good news for our customers, the farmers around the world. No matter what type of agriculture. If you had told someone two decades ago that by 2018, the company that commercialized chemical warfare and the company that commercialized Agent Orange were going to team up to control a quarter of the world's food supply, chances are you would have been labeled a loony. Unless your name was Robert P. Shapiro. He was CEO of Monsanto from 1995 to 2000. And in 1999, he told Businessweek that the company's goal was to wed three of the largest industries in the world, agriculture, food, and health, that now operate as separate businesses. But there are a set of changes that will lead to their integration. With this month's announcement that Bayer had completed its $63 billion acquisition of Monsanto, it is hard to deny that Shapiro's vision has been realized. Too bad for all of us, that vision is a nightmare. Because, contrary to the feel-good corporate propaganda being churned out by the company's PR department, propaganda that would have you believe that this merger will be good for the environment, for farmers, for ending global hunger, and, incidentally, for lining the pockets of shareholders, these two corporate giants are in fact committed to the consolidation and transformation of the world's food supply in the hands of the genetic engineers. Monsanto and Bayer are a match made in hell. This is the Corbett Report. It is hardly surprising that the first thing Bayer did after completing their takeover of Monsanto earlier this month was to announce that they were dropping the Monsanto name, merging the two companies' agrochemical divisions under the Bayer Crop Science name. After all, as everyone knows, Monsanto is one of the most hated corporations in the world. In the f film uh, Food Evolution, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson notes that Monsanto is one of the most hated companies in the world. Why do people have such strong feelings uh, toward Monsanto? The worldwide march against Monsanto has drawn hundreds out onto the streets here in New York City with people seizing the opportunity to voice their uh, concerns and opposition uh, to GMO foods. Why are you here? <laughs> I am here because I have a loathing hatred for the company Monsanto, which uh, a lot of people don't know that Monsanto is actually just a chemical company and they have no business uh, basically dictating our food supply. New at noon, the city of Seattle is suing biotech giant Monsanto to make it pay for removing cancer-causing chemicals in the water. The city says the company knowingly dumped the compounds in the city's drainage system and the Duwamish River for years. Seattle needs to build a stormwater treatment plant to clean the system. That will cost about $27 million. Six other major municipalities sued Monsanto as well. Environmental lawyers have begun filing lawsuits against Monsanto for cancer deaths related to their product Roundup. What these lawsuits are showing is an effort both on the part of Monsanto and the U.S. government to minimize the message about the dangers of Roundup in relationship to human cancer. Now your bullseye is on Monsanto. Why is Monsanto so crucial to this fight over seeds? Monsanto is crucial to this fight because they are the biggest seed company now. Monsanto is privatizing the seed. They control 95% of the cotton in India, 90% of the soil in this country. They've taken over most of the seed companies of the world. This hatred of Monsanto is not unreasonable. It is, after all, difficult to think of a company that has ruined the lives of more people around the world either directly through its coercive and litigious practices against small farmers the world over, or indirectly through the pollution of the food supply with their genetically modified crops. Many are familiar with the company's sordid past, including its role in the development of Agent Orange and its contribution to the epidemic of farmer suicides in India. But in recent years, Monsanto has gained special notoriety for its attempt to push the boundary of patent law in a self-admitted effort to gain a monopoly over the world's food supply. Even worse, Monsanto has, thanks to a revolving door with the highest levels of the U.S. government, been not just evil, 
but extraordinarily effective in spreading its evil seed around the world. That revolving door has seen literally dozens of top Monsanto executives drift in and out of the U.S. government agencies that, laughably, are said to regulate the agrochemical business, including Dennis DiConcini, the former U.S. senator who now acts as legislative consultant for Monsanto, Mickey Cantor, the Commerce Secretary under President Clinton who also served on Monsanto's board of directors, Michael Taylor, Obama's deputy FDA commissioner who had previously served as Monsanto's vice president for public policy, Linda Fisher, who was appointed deputy administrator of the EPA in 2001, fresh off a five-year stint as Monsanto's vice president of government and public affairs, and U.S. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, who served as a corporate lawyer for Monsanto in the 1970s. These officials have helped smooth the way for Monsanto to achieve a number of key corporate objectives, including the passage of the infamous Monsanto Protection Act in 2013. First off, President Barack Obama recently signed into law what many are calling the Monsanto Protection Act. Monsanto, the world's leading producer of genetically modified food, will benefit greatly from the bill since the legislation gives companies dealing in modified organisms and genetically engineered seeds immunity from federal courts. Nothing creepy about that. The bill states that even if future research shows that GMOs or GE seeds cause major health issues in consumers, the federal courts will have no power to stop their spread, use, or sale. Interesting to note, the bill carrying the Monsanto Rider has virtually nothing to do with food, agriculture, or consumer health. It was inserted into a spending bill through lobbying efforts and the good work of freshman Senator Roy Blunt. Well, congratulations, Mr. Blunt. Well done. Very good. You'd be writing him a letter. I love Mr. Blunt because Monsanto's such a wonderfully like healthy, nutritious company. Really looking out you know, and I'm <laughs> it's amazing. The Center for Responsive Politics notes that Senator Blunt received $64,250 oh. from Monsanto oh. for his campaign committee between 2000 and That had nothing to do with him making a protection of bill or anything not. like that. That was just purely good citizenry at work. Of course. Uh, Mr. Mr. Blunt has been the largest Republican recipient of Monsanto funding as of late. Oh, lovely. So basically, my, you know, Mr. Blunt gave him an out clause. We don't know what these GMO seeds and all that crazy they do does sorry for the sailor talk but you know we don't know what these cats do they basically are, are poisoning you know the plants to kill bugs and their the, pesticides are actually killing the bee population there's research to prove it and now because of this law technically we can't do anything about yeah, it yeah we can't go back as citizens the government can't go back and sue mm -hmm. them or, or hold them accountable for any of the actions yeah. that they've done this is beautiful this is wonderful politics as usual you know the old uh, you know pay to play kind of technique of you know we'll give you x amount of dollars get you elected and then help us out here Ironically, of all the corporations in the world, Bayer is one of the few that could compete with Monsanto for its position as the world's most evil company. There are two huge issues with this Bayer Monsanto merger. Uh, the first is that it's going to raise food prices all across the United States even, and even beyond our borders. Farmers have already experienced a 300 percent price increase in recent years on everything from seeds to fertilizer, all of which are controlled by Monsanto. And every forecaster is predicting that these prices are going to climb even higher because of this merger. So we're going to have this massive price hike at a time when 14 million Americans have already been unable to provide food for their families. And and then we're going to have this ethical problem that's plagued both of these corporations for decades. Let's start with Monsanto. This is a company that produced Agent Orange, which resulted in one of the largest human-induced health epidemics in modern history. They made dioxin. They created and distributed PCBs across the planet. And now pending litigation against them for Roundup is right there. Looking at their rap sheet would scare the heck out of anybody with a brain. They're in the business. Actually, really, when you drill down to it, it looks more like a cancer business than anything. They've been hit for false advertising and bribing public officials, then moved to Bear. So we got Bear and we got Monsanto. Moved to Bear. This is a company that's joined at the hip with the Nazis during World War II. They produced a clotting agent for hemophiliacs in the 1980s called Factor 8. This blood clotting agent was tainted with HIV and then after the government told them they couldn't sell it here, they shipped it all over the all over the world, infecting people all over the world. That's the company. That's part, that's just part 
part of the bear story. Right now, they're facing lawsuits over products like Yaz, uh, Zarelto, uh, Esure, Cipro. In fact, the company in 2014 annual report listed 32 different liability lawsuits that the company's now facing. So now you have the worst of the worst joining with the worst of the worst, and we have this magnificent experience of greed with these two huge corporations. This is a merger of evil, probably second only to the kind of merger that we'd see with DuPont and Dow Chemical. It's an ugly story. Again, the media is missing the point. They're not looking at all behind what these people are all, and they're people. These, are, these corporations are regarded as people. If these are people on a witness stand, <laughs> it's going to be a very ugly cross-examination. These are people who should probably be in prison rather than engaging in mergers. Although less well-known by the general public, Bayer's shameful history is, like Monsanto's, a case study in corporate psychopathy. Founded in 1863 by Friedrich Bayer and Johann Friedrich Vescott, it wasn't until 1899 that the company trademarked its most well-known product, aspirin. Less well-remembered is the fact that Bayer was the first company to trademark heroin, which they marketed as a non-addictive alternative to morphine and a cough suppressant. But it was under the stewardship of Carl Duisberg at the turn of the 20th century that the company began to develop its psychopathic character. In 1914, the German Ministry of War appointed Duisberg as one of the co-directors of a commission into the use of dangerous byproducts from the chemical industry. Unsurprisingly, Duisberg and his fellow directors jumped at the opportunity to turn their waste into profit by recommending the development of chlorine gas for use on the battlefield a direct contravention of the Hague Convention respecting the laws and customs of war on land, which Germany had signed just seven years earlier. Bayer, under Duisberg's command, did not just participate in the development and use of poison gas in warfare. They spearheaded it. Duisberg personally oversaw the earliest tests of poison gas and bragged about its lethal capabilities. The enemy won't even know when an area has been sprayed with it, and will remain quietly in place until the consequences occur. Setting up a school for chemical warfare at Bayer headquarters in Leverkusen, Duisberg also oversaw the development of phosgene and mustard gas, which he urged the German government to use. This phosgene is the meanest weapon I know. I strongly recommend that we not let the opportunity of this war pass without also testing gas grenades. On April 22, 1915, Duisberg got his wish, on that day, 170 tons of chlorine gas was used against French troops at Ypres, Belgium, killing 1,000 and injuring a further 4,000. Attacks on the British followed days later. In all, some 60,000 people died as the result of the chemical warfare perfected by Bayer and urged on by Duisburg, one of the great, largely forgotten atrocities of the First World War. Most galling of all, Duisburg was not ashamed of his accomplishments. On the contrary, he was immensely proud of them. He even commissioned famed artist Otto Ballhagen to paint the scene of the earliest poison gas test at Cologne. Duisburg so enjoyed the finished result that he had it hung in his breakfast room at Bayer headquarters in Leverkusen. Later, Duisburg, inspired by a tour of Rockefeller's Standard Oil in the U.S., wedded Bayer to the IG Farben chemical cartel. As I explained in How Big Oil Conquered the World, IG Farben was a key player in the burgeoning oligarchy of the early 20th century, boasting key oligarchs like Royal Dutch Shell's Prince Bernhard and Standard Oil's Walter Teagle on the boards of its various branches. Byers Duisburg served as the head of its supervisory board. Joining Duisburg on the board was Fritz Termeer, who oversaw the construction of the IG Farben factory at Auschwitz, which ran on slave labor and participated in human experimentation. After the war, Termeer was sentenced to seven years in prison for his participation in looting and enslavement of the camp prisoners, but was released in 1954, good behavior, and in 1956 became chairman of Bayer AG, newly resurrected from the ashes of IG Farben. But this legacy of death is not some ancient relic of Bayer's distant past. Decade after decade, the company continues to be involved in scandal after scandal, involving wanton environmental destruction, injury, and even mass murder. Bayer accidentally funds studies showing its pesticide is killing the bees and promptly denies those conclusions. A large-scale study on neonicotinoid pesticides is adding to the growing body of evidence 
that these agriculture chemicals are indeed harming bee populations, to say the very least. Carried out at 33 sites in the United Kingdom, Germany, Hungary, the study found that exposure to neonicotinoids, quote, left honeybee hives less likely to survive over winter, while bumblebees and solitary bees produced fewer queens, end quote. Mirena is a chemical-coated, soft plastic IUD that proved to be a huge moneymaker for Bayer. But part of the reason that this particular contraceptive was so profitable was because Bayer was deliberately overstating the benefits of their device and not disclosing some of the rare but dangerous side effects. For example, in April of 2009, the FDA had to issue a warning letter to Bayer Healthcare because its website for Mirena made a number of claims that were simply untrue or unproven. Bear was so busy making claims that the IUD was a perfect solution for busy moms and would increase women's sex lives while making them look and feel great that it forgot to mention that the device is recommended for women who've already had at least one child. The company also declined to state that the Mirena IUD increases the risk of ectopic pregnancies, which is when a fertilized egg attaches to an area other than the uterus. So the CEO was actually speaking to Bloomberg Business Week, and he is trying to appeal the Indian court's decision to uh, allow this patent for another company. He said the following, we did not develop this medicine for Indians. We developed it for Western patients who can afford it. Oh, oh, oh. and look at that face. That's the kind of face that would say a thing like that. Doesn't he look so smug, like, oh, please. We didn't develop this for Indians. It's we developed disgusting. it for Westerners who are rich. In the 1980s, Bayer Corporation produced a medicine that was supposed to improve the lives of hemophiliacs. Bayer didn't tell those hemophiliacs that their product was infected with HIV. Because of that, entire families of hemophiliacs died with AIDS as the virus spread within households. When Bayer was ordered to stop selling their drug in America, they dumped their AIDS-laden product in Asia and killed Asian families. No one with Bayer management was arrested. No one who made these psychopathic quality decisions went to prison. They claimed the protection of their status as a corporation. That corporate status gave management the ability to kill people for profit and not go to prison. Indeed, it is not difficult to see why these two companies, each one a titan of its respective industry, each one guilty of the most atrocious crimes against humanity and the destruction of the environment, would feel an affinity for each other. But why merge? What does a pharmaceutical giant have to gain from buying out and merging with an agrochemical giant, especially one that carries as much baggage as Monsanto? If the connection between these corporate behemoths seems tenuous, then perhaps the key to understanding it is presented in that 1995 quote from former Monsanto CEO Robert Shapiro. We're talking about three of the largest industries in the world, agriculture, food, and health, that now operate as separate businesses. But there are a set of changes that will lead to their integration. Integration of agriculture, food, and health is the goal, and once that goal is reached, the entire life support system of the human population, including all our food and medicine, will be in the hands of a few megacorporations. Indeed, the history of the production of food and pharmaceuticals has always followed the same trajectory, away from natural, abundant, locally produced organic materials and toward artificial, scarce, factory-produced synthetic alternatives. Control of the global food supply is, needless to say, along with control of money and oil, one of the pillars upon which the globalist oligarchs seek to construct their system of total control. Although there is no proof whatsoever that he said it, the dubious quote sometimes attributed to Henry Kissinger is nonetheless quite true. Who controls the food supply controls the people. Who controls the energy can control whole continents. Who controls money can control the world. The process of consolidating these industries is of course nothing new. In fact, it started long ago. As I explained in How Big Oil Conquered the World, even the current agrochemical industry has to be seen in its historical context as a fusion of the petrochemical fertilizer giants, DuPont, Dow, Hercules Powder, and other businesses in the standard oil orbit, with the ABC seed cartel of Archer Daniels Midland, Bunge, Cargill, and Louis Dreyfus. These previously separate fields were gradually consolidated under the flag of agribusiness, itself developed at Harvard Business School in the 1950s with the help of research conducted by Vasily Leontief for the Rockefeller Foundation. 
And as I also explained in How Big Oil Conquered the World, Big Pharma too was a creation of the same drive toward consolidation and spearheaded by the same people. From the Carnegie and Rockefeller-funded institutionalization of the medical profession, to Standard Oil's role in supplying the petrochemicals for the burgeoning pharmaceutical industry, to the role of Rockefeller Institute researchers like Cornelius Rhodes, who developed chemotherapy from the mustard gas pioneered by Bayer, the overlap of the oligarchical interests in cementing global control has been abundantly clear. Then, with the advancement of GMO technology in the 1980s and 1990s, again with considerable help from the Rockefellers and other oligarchical interests, new opportunities for consolidation presented themselves. Seeds used to be sold by seed companies, and fertilizers and herbicides used to be sold by chemical companies. But then the GMO revolution came along, and all of these companies spun off biotech branches to genetically engineer seeds. That, in turn, opened up opportunities to create GMO seed strains that are tailored to work with patented herbicides and fertilizers. The combination of GMO seeds and specially tailored agrochemicals has been especially lucrative for Monsanto, which was the first to capitalize on those synergies when it won regulatory approval for its first Roundup-ready soybeans in 1994. Roundup, aka glyphosate, has gone on to become the most used agricultural chemical in the history of the world. Monsanto and Bayer, not to mention their cohorts in the agrochemical, pharmaceutical, and euphemistically named life sciences industries, are ultimately seeking the same thing, complete control over the population, from the genetic engineering of its food supply to the control of its medicines and chemicals. It is a race toward complete centralization, and with this acquisition, Bayer and Monsanto are getting a head start. Particularly frightening, then, though hardly surprising, that this latest round of consolidation is being spearheaded by two corporations as thoroughly deplorable as Bayer and Monsanto. Bayer, one of the pieces of IG Farben's grim and oligarchical legacy, supplier of chemicals for the poison gas attacks of World War I, knowing seller of HIV-contaminated vaccines, mass murderer of bees, seller of tainted GMO crops, and Monsanto, dumper of toxic chemicals, proud seller of carcinogens, sewer of farmers, cause of farmer suicides, suppressor of scientific dissent. Are you feeling safe knowing that a quarter of the world's food supply will soon be in their combined hands? If not, then all of the efforts that have been made in recent years to march against Monsanto must be translated into a boycott against Bayer and all of their friends in the burgeoning biotech big agra seed cartel GMO Franken industry. It is only by increasing our support for locally sourced, organic, heirloom seed grown produce that we can hope to supplant this new mega giant and consign it to the dustbin of history where it belongs. The Corbett Report is brought to you by the DACA DVD series. From 2007 to 2016, each set of DATA DVDs contains every podcast, every article, every video, and every interview from that year's the website. Celebrate the Corbett Report's decade of alternative media dominance by owning it all, only on these DATA DVDs. For more information, please go to corbettreport.com slash DATA DVD.